people are interested to hear how we do. So, the, uh, so this is a little bit of an experiment. Um, as you know, uh, we've had great attendance to Grand Rounds, but we would like to get back to some semblance of in-person, but never lose access by always providing remote as well. So we will continue to do that. This may take a little finesse, uh, finessing sounds, slides, and questions. So I'd, I'd ask for your patience today. I would also ask those attending remotely to um, mute yourself and place your questions in the chat. At the end of the presentation, uh, Dr. Weintraub will be taking questions alternately from the chat and from the room. For our audience here today, and I thank all of you for coming, um, we are gonna ask you to add, to ask your questions through the microphone in the middle of the room, or I have another one we can run around so that the people attending remotely can hear your questions and your comments. So I'd like to welcome again, everyone to the 21st Taylor Lecture sponsored this year by the Department of Psychiatry. The Taylor Lectureship in Neurology and Psychiatry was endowed in, endowed in um, 1986 by Ronald Taylor, Dr. Richard, by Dr. Ronald Taylor, Dr. Richard and Ms. Catherine Taylor to promote and encourage forever at the School of Medicine, the continuing and important interplay between our two departments. It is very exciting to have this opportunity to share experiences, ideas, and expertise between our departments. I would like to take a minute to share some interesting facts about our, sponsor, our sponsoring and guest speaker families. We have two dynasties. Dr. Richard Taylor, who is with us today, is an alum of the School of Medicine and was the first in the first class of the CAP program, which is the Combined Accelerated Program in Psychiatry under the leadership of Dr. Walter Weintraub. So there is a weave here being, there's a web here being weaved. Dr. Richard Taylor went on to become a neurologist. His brother, Ronald Taylor, also an alum of the School of Medicine, completed his residency here in the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Irving Taylor, Dr. Richard Taylor's uncle, <laughs> Uh, was a, a psychiatrist and the founder of the Taylor Manor Psychiatric Hospital in Ellicott City. Following uh, Dr. Irving Taylor's leadership, Dr. Bruce Taylor, his son, also a psychiatrist, ran the hospital until its closing about 12 years ago. Dr. Bruce Taylor continues a small practice today in, in addition to other adventures. The Taylor family has been generous generously supportive of both departments of psychiatry and neurology, including the endowment of both of um, our chair positions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Taylor and his wife, Catherine, have graciously uh, also endowed the neurology chair and the investiture will be in May. We are most grateful for all of this support. The second dynasty of neuroscientists uh, is the Weintraub family to which um, our invited speaker is a member. Dr. Daniel Weintraub is the son of Dr. Walter Weintraub, who was our residency training director for many, many years, and who also founded the, pro the CAP program that I mentioned earlier. Dr. Weintraub had four children, all psychiatrists, three who attended the University of Maryland School of Medicine and our residency training program. Philip was the oldest, uh, Dan and Eric, correct me if I get this wrong. <laughs> Philip was the oldest and is a child psychiatrist. Eric, second in line, who's an addiction psychiatrist and we know Eric well. Dan, third in line, what is, no, not third, you're last. Oh, you're the baby, okay. Third is Michelle, who is an adult psychiatrist practicing in Florida. And Dr. Daniel Weintraub is a geriatric psychiatrist. I had that out of order, I apologize. The influence of these two families has been and continues to be very impressive, and we are proud to have relationships with both of these families. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our guest lecturer. Dr. Daniel Weintraub completed his medical school, residency, and geriatric fellowship predictably here at the University of Maryland. 
<clears throat> and he eventually moved through a couple of years and landed at the University of Pennsylvania where his career has simply catapulted. He is professor of psychiatry and neurology at the Perlman School of Medicine and psychiatrist at the Parkinson's Disease Research Education and Clinical Center at the Philadelphia VA. He's a board certified geriatric psychiatrist serving on multiple task forces and working uh, and working groups of an international uh, Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. He does clinical research in psychiatric and cognitive complications of Parkinson's disease. He also co-chairs the Cognitive Behavioral Work Group of the Fox Foundation funded Parkinson's Progress Progression Markers Initiative and is an advisor to the Critical Path for Parkinson's Consortium. Dr. Weintraub is an associate editor of Movement Disorder Journal. He's an ad hoc interviewer for 40 different journals. He has over 250 peer reviewed articles. I lost track of counting and has co authored three books. We are honored and privileged to have Dan with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Weintraub as he presents Parkinson's disease, the interface between psychiatry and neurology. Thank you, Jill. Um, God, it's embarrassing to hear all those nice things. I don't know why it is, but um, I am the baby of the family, the four of us, and um, I'll have a picture to show. So before I forget, thank you to the Taylors. It was really nice to have dinner with you and your wife last night. I really enjoyed that. And it's amazing what you've done to endow um, both chair positions for two departments at Maryland. So that's really wonderful. Um, tell me if I need to switch. Can people hear? I can switch. Um, Okay. Um, and it's great to be in person. I insisted to Jill. She kept pushing back as Jill can, kept saying, come, come. Then I said, well, I'll wait until I can come in person. So I'm really glad I did, mainly because I got great crab cakes for dinner last night. <laughs> and I would not have been able to do that virtually and or enjoy the conversation the way we did. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's much else to say um, other than I'll, I'll just get started. and. Um, Oh, th there's a little bit more time devoted to this than a typical lecture presentation. So I did add in some extra slides, but it's my job to try to make it interesting. I won't try to bore you with all the details on the slides, but it, it's nice to not feel so rushed because there's a lot of um, interesting information to cover in a talk like this. And Jill wanted me to mention a little bit about um, integrated psychiatry and neurology care. So I did um, spend a little time on that at the end as well. Okay. So I'm hitting the next, but nothing's happening. Unless I'm hitting it the wrong way. And I can add this microphone and so please, if I'm not audible, let me know. Let's just try before you leave, I'll go back. Okay, so I struggle to find pictures. Um, the one on the left, I'm sorry, Richard, you're not in this one, but... Um, this is the psychiatry tailors of uh, three of the four, uh, three, two of the three psychiatry tailors and Richard being a neurology tailor. So they, th your family has really embodied kind of the um, integration of psychiatry and neurology. So that's um, um, Bruce and Irving um, in this picture. And I don't know who, who the woman is in the middle. I should know, but. Okay, so that's your aunt, okay who is an integral part of the practice, um, I can tell. And then on the right is a very dated picture now. I had to find one that didn't have my mom in it because she was not a psychiatrist. Um, Eric's the second one from the left in this picture and I'm the far one on the right. So even though I am the youngest, I am the tallest as you can say. <laughs> um, and that's um, our dad, Walter in the middle there. Okay, so this is the organization. I, I tried to organize it in a way that I thought might make it interesting to present. So I kind of move things around from the way I would usually do it. And I won't go through the details. I did make cognitive impairment a separate topic at the end because it's such an important topic for Parkinson's disease. I thought it, de it deserved its own separate attention. 
So Parkinson's disease clearly is more than a motor disorder, although it's still diagnosed on the basis of the motor features and always will be, and it's um, treated primarily by neurologists. The reason I say that is because it's really a quintessential neuropsychiatric disease. Um, if you don't consider the psychiatric or more broadly non-motor aspects, you really aren't able to provide adequate care to people with Parkinson's disease. So if you open up DSM-5 and look at the various chapters, really any of the disorders that are listed there can occur in Parkinson's disease. The ones I have highlighted in yellow because of my interest in what time allows are the ones I'll discuss today. So depression and anxiety are more broadly affective disorders, psychosis impulse control disorders and related behaviors, what are called ICDs, and then cognitive impairment. And the background that makes this so interesting is that the neural substrate of Parkinson's disease is directly relevant to the neural substrate of many psychiatric disorders. So whether you're talking about brain regions such as the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex, the neurotransmitters that are affected in Parkinson's disease, starting with brainstem neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and serotonin, and then up through midbrain and then even cortical regions of so more dopamine and acetylcholine are integral to both the Parkinson's and the psychiatric manifestations of Parkinson's disease. And then finally, the neur neural pathways implicated in Parkinson's disease, so for instance, striatal frontal pathways are important for both psychiatry in general and for Parkinson's disease. Um, prodromal symptoms, which is a really an emerging area. So these are people that have non-motor features predominantly, often neuropsychiatric symptoms, before they have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, really give biological plausibility to this neuropsychiatry of Parkinson's disease, because these are people that don't know they have Parkinson's disease. They really have no or very few motor symptoms at this point, but yet they have an increased risk of multiple psychiatric disorders. And then finally, there's always been this overlap between neurology and psychiatry in terms of shared treatments. And some of the examples in this case would be selegiline patch. Selegiline is an MAOB inhibitor um, used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, but it's also in its patch formulation for treatment resistant depression in the general population. Dopamine agonists are a core treatment for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but also have been tested for major depressive disorder in the general population. And finally, deep brain stimulation really used first and still foremost, I'd say, for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease has wide applicability in psychiatry, whether it's in research or even in clinical care. <laughs> So here's some data that I'll um, show. I'll, I'll intersperse different studies, primarily or often ones that I've been involved in, but this is from the Michael J. Fox Foundation Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative Study, or the PPMI study that it's called. And what's impressive about this study is that it's taken a fairly large cohort of about 400 Parkinson's patients who are newly diagnosed and untreated and then follows them forward. And this cohort has about 10 years into their illness on average now. It's a very biomarker rich study to help understand the neurobiology of Parkinson's disease and its progression. And as part of the study, there are some neuropsychiatric or non-motor assessments. So this is data we published just looking at the first five years of the Parkinson's disease patients in this cohort. There's also healthy controls as well. And really what I wanna point out is that there are numerous um, psychiatric disorders that are present even at the time of diagnosis and um, progress over the first five years of the illness, depression, anxiety, fatigue, sleep and wakefulness disorders, so things such as insomnia and excessive daytime sleepiness and even cognitive changes. What also happens as the five years, even the first five years of the illness progress is that you notice that these disorders become highly comorbid. <clears throat> so it's not as if somebody may just be depressed and often not have other symptoms. So if you look at the bottom right of this pie chart figure, um, by the time you get to year five of the illness, over 50% of Parkinson's disease patients will screen for three or more psychiatric disorders at the same time. So back to the prodromal um, phase of Parkinson's disease and really highlighting that this is a brain disorder. 
I'd say the strongest risk in, in an area of very active research still is what's called idiopathic RBD or IRBD. RBD standing for rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. So that's a parasomnia characterized by dream enactment that emerges after a loss of REM sleep atonia. So patients physically and verbally act out their dreams during the REM phase of sleep. It's often not the patient that will notice this, but their bed partner. And what we know now about this illness is that it has a near 100% conversion to what I'll call LBD, a Lewy body disorder, over the course of 15 years. So Lewy body disorder in this case, and this is another very interesting aspect of RBD, it can either be Parkinson's disease or the other major LBD, which is dementia with Lewy bodies. So it's about a 50-50 conversion um, to either DLB or PD. And this is one of the things, one, it's amazing that you have this near universal conversion from this sleep disorder to a Lewy body disorder, but we don't understand which patients are gonna progress more to a motor disorder primarily, at least at first, and be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and which are gonna convert more to a dementia syndrome and therefore be diagnosed with dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB. Beyond just that sleep disorder, this is research from a, a colleague in the United Kingdom, um, Annette Schrag, who has access to large population UK-based research um, data sets, looking at non-motor or psychiatric symptoms predicting Parkinson's disease development. And you can see even in the years leading up, sometimes five, 10 years prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, there's an increased risk or likelihood of having depression and anxiety in this case. So those are the two psychiatric disorders most strongly linked with prodromal Parkinson's disease. And then finally, we had a chance to um, look at cognitive differences in at-risk Parkinson's disease patients. And there have since been numerous studies um, replicating this or looking at it slightly different fashion. This is called the PAR study. It was the po Parkinson's Associated Risk Study. And the goal here was to look at people who were at risk of Parkinson's disease on the basis of two features. One, they were hyposmic, so they had impaired smell, which is another prodromal feature of Parkinson's disease. And in addition to that, they had impaired DAT or dopamine transporter SPECT binding, showing um, nigrostriatal dopamine deficits. So if you look at those patients who do not have Parkinson's disease, have little or no motor symptoms at the point of this study, but have impaired smell and impaired DAT scan testing results, you can demonstrate cognitive differences between that group and patients that don't have these features. That's in global cognition, executive function and working memory, processing speed and attention, and just memory itself. So the cognitive changes, which I'll mention later, can start to manifest themselves even in the prodromal phase of Parkinson's disease, at least at a minor level. This led um, studies such as this and other studies led the MDS. MDS stands for Movement Disorder Society. That's the large organization that really covers Parkinson's disease from a clinical and clinical research standpoint. So they developed research criteria for prodromal Parkinson's disease and these non-motor symptoms first included REM behavior disorder, impaired olfaction, constipation, sleepiness, and depression. But then on the basis of some of the studies that I mentioned um, just on the last slide, cognition more recently was added to be one of the prodromal features as well. All right, so that's prodromal Parkinson's disease. Now, just a little bit um, about epidemiology and nosology. I don't want to spend time showing you slides that these disorders are common, because um, that would be obvious um, to state for many of these and, and not so interesting. Um, so when I think about psychiatric disturbances in Parkinson's disease, I often think about how they're similar yet different from similar disorders in the general population. Recognition is really the start. So this is kind of a plug for something that I and some colleagues have spent a lot of time on recently was understanding that psychiatric features in Parkinson's disease are under-recognized and under-treated, still have been forever. Um, is there a way to enhance their recognition in clinical care, clinical research? So we took, uh, approached the Movement Disorder Society and asked them if we would 
um, have permission and funding from them to develop a non-motor rating scale. And this was the result. It's called the MDS NMS or non-motor rating scale. And it complements their major neurological instrument for Parkinson's disease, which is the MDS UPDRS, which really assesses and rates the severity of motor symptoms. So this is specifically the non-motor complement to that. It's a 52 item instrument across 13 domains that assesses all of the major non-motor, including psychiatric features of Parkinson's disease. And we just published this a few years ago and it's uh, available for use. So, Thinking of depression specifically, one of the difficulties in treating patients, assessing, managing patients in depression and some other symptoms as well is the extensive overlap in this case between uh, Parkinson's disease and um, the DSM features or the, the nine core features of depression. So all the ones with a red arrow I highlight because they're common both in Parkinson's disease, whether you're depressed or not, and they're, of course, they're core symptoms of depression as well. So how do we deal with this? Well, not in a clearly satisfactory way, but we typically use what's called an inclusive scoring approach um, so that people will not be denied access to antidepressant treatment in case they are depressed. And we don't try to clearly attribute symptoms to depression or Parkinson's disease. We just take them at face value. And then we've removed or diminish our um, emphasis on decre de decreased interest because there's so much apathy in Parkinson's disease that diminished interest is thought to be a less specific marker for, par uh, for depression. So we focus more on decreased pleasure. There's also been over the years, although this is less true, um, the involvement of the FDA in a way that made it probably less enticing for pharmaceutical companies to be interested in developing depression treatment strategies. And this is the whole notion of pseudo-specificity that's long been a hallmark of FDA's thinking about disorders such as depression and Parkinson's disease, that they were not interested in considering or approving a medication for depression and Parkinson's disease because they wanted to know that depression and Parkinson's disease was specific to the illness, that it wasn't just depression in the general population which is really impossible to demonstrate. And this research just helps illustrate that, that when you look at predictors of Parkinson's disease depression, uh, most of the predictors are nonspecific variables that are true for predicting depression in the general population. And that Parkinson's specific variables are relatively uncommon. So we've never been able to clearly say that depression is specific to Parkinson's disease or there's a unique depression syndrome. And fortunately, the FDA has really moved off of this thinking now. Um, so hopefully this is not an issue moving forward. Concerning psychosis, I'd say the major change in, in our understanding of psychosis in the time that I've been involved, that's a two decades now, is that it used to be thought that visual hallucinations were the predominant hallucinations and that uh, delusions were uncommon. And there really wasn't a sense of what we call uh, minor hallucinations or minor psychosis at that point. So now we know from research that it's not just visual hallucinations. They may be the most common, but that auditory and other hallucinations occur as well. So you need to be able to screen for those. Um, delusions are less common, but are more common than we once thought. So it's often a combination of psych, uh, hallucinations and delusions. And then finally, there's this whole area of minor psychosis, which is presence or passage phenomena. So presence is the sense of something in the periphery of your vision. Vision Passage is the sense of something moving in the periphery of your vision. And visual illusions, which is just the misidentification of an actual object, are all much more common than we thought. And if you sum all of these up or follow people long enough, over half of patients with Parkinson's disease will experience psychosis at some point in the course of their illness. Shifting over now to impulse control disorder. So the, the pictures tell the story here about what are the four most common. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but these are the four most common and probably problematic impulse control disorders that can occur in Parkinson's disease. So left to right, um, buying or shopping, gambling, eating behaviors and sexual behaviors. And these numbers, um, that are listed on the top or the frequency in a cross-sectional study of over 3,000 patients um, that we did over a decade ago now in the United States and Canada. 
Um, the number right below that with the asterisks is those percentage of patients that were on a dopamine agonist, one of the Parkinson's medications I'll get back to that had one of these disorders. So if you, when you add it up at the end of the day in this study, about 15% of patients had an impulse control disorder. So it's really a, a quite a significant um, percentage and it really led to um, significant changing in the prescribing practices of neurologists, I'd say over the last decade, where dopamine agonists, which used to be the first line agent for untreated de novo Parkinson's patients is no longer the first line treatment for most patients. So a little bit about um, neurobiology. So I'll say this is dopamine and more. So I'll emphasize the role of dopamine in some of these disorders and then the role of other um, neurobiological influences that are not dopamine specific. So really the, the disorder that I think has the clearest um, dopaminergic input and link are what are called non-motor fluctuations. So these are patients with Parkinson's disease, usually long-standing illness, which means that they've been on levodopa because everybody with Parkinson's disease or nearly everybody, if you've had the illness for long enough is treated with levodopa, maybe other things as well. And what happens when you're treated with levodopa for long enough, your dosage tends to increase, the frequency between administration decreases because you develop what are called off periods where your motor symptoms um, worsen over the course of a couple of hours. So you need to decrease the frequency, increase the dose to chase after that, so to speak but patients can develop what are called non-motor fluctuations as well. So that means as their Parkinson's medications is wearing off every couple of hours or particular times of a day, they develop these non-motor features that can become quite disabling for people. Probably the most obvious one that you see clinically most problematic are people that develop panic attacks in the context of this wearing off phenomena. Yet they take their next dose of levodopa and an hour later they feel significantly better. So this is really quite a clear link or association between rising and dropping peaks and troughs of levodopa levels. And they've actually done blood level studies to kind of demonstrate the association even more directly with these non-motor fluctuations. Another disorder that I would say um, the most strongly associates with dopamine are the impulse control disorders. So this is again, PPMI data from the Fox Foundation. And this was looking at baseline data. So this is when people first enrolled in the study, first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and untreated. And this is the advantage of having a healthy control group in the study. We were able to screen for impulse control disorders and show there was no statistically significant differences in untreated Parkinson's patients um, for impulse control disorders compared with controls. And this was actually a fairly significant issue at the time because many people wondered, is it just the Parkinson's disease or people particularly with strong consulting ties with pharmaceutical companies were hesitant to make this association and wondered if there was some other explanation. But this and other studies like it really helped demonstrate that it's not the Parkinson's itself or any lifelong history that these people have that put them um, make them clearly have an increased risk for these disorders. So in that Dominion uh, study that I mentioned, that study of over 3000 patients, this was the strongest association between um, having an impulse control disorder or not was dopamine agonist DA treatment. So these are the medications that directly bind um, to uh, D2, D3 receptors in the striatum. Um, there's several of them that are available, and it, this explained about half of the population attributable risk for having an impulse control disorder, just exposure to this medication class. But interestingly, things such as higher doses of levodopa treatment, not just being on any levodopa treatment, but higher doses particularly, also explain some of the variants. And since then, really all of the Parkinson's disease medications, MAOB inhibitors, amantadine, anything really with a pro-dopaminergic effect has in some way been associated with impulse control disorders as well. So it's dopamine agonist, but it's really more than just that. So when I'm assessing a patient, I look at the totality of their Parkinson's disease treatments, not just their dopamine agonists. And this is um, confirmation of what I just said in a PET binding study, 11 raclopride, so an agent that's used commonly in psych psychiatric research as well, but showing patients with pathological gambling, that's PG, and giving them a gambling task um, in a PET scanner and looking at those with 
um, impulse control disorder versus those without, and showing clear differences in binding, particularly in the ventral striatum for those patients that have uh, pathological gambling, as it was called here. We since then went back um, to the Fox Foundation PPMI study and wanted to see if not only could you do something cross-sectionally, but one of the nice things about the study, again, is that patients are followed longitudinally. So we looked at people who developed incident ICDs over the first few years of their illness. So people that did not have it at baseline, but then screened positive for an impulse control disorder later. And we were able to show that their dopamine transporter availability, that, that scan that I was talking about before, um, either at baseline or changes over time um, helped predict um, the development of incident ICD. So again, tying the dopamine system together. And then we tried to do one other thing, which was we were interested in seeing if we could take a precision medicine approach. And what we did was we took some of the common SNPs that are associated with, or genes that are associated with impulse control disorders in the general population, and saw if, wanted to see if we could combine those with clinical predictors to develop um, a prediction model that was better than just the clinical markers themselves. And it turned out by folding in a couple of other um, genes in particular related to the serotonin system, the opioid receptor and dopamine decarboxylase, you could increase the area under the curve of predicting who develops an incident impulse control disorder. So this is an area of kind of ongoing research, I'd say in Parkinson's disease, it's certainly not settled, but whether you can develop these kinds of models that might help you determine who's at highest risk of developing an impulse control disorder before you start them on a treatment. And this is just showing the area under the curve improvement with the clinical plus genetic uh, model versus just the clinical model. And then I think finally for this part, um, back to dopaminergic medication, but here showing how it, the story gets more complex when you're talking about psychosis. So this was people at baseline in the PPMI study, very few of whom either in the Parkinson's group or healthy controls had any psychosis at baseline, again, untreated state. So what happens over the first couple of years of the illness? This is just looking at two year data back then. So you can see how the rates in Parkinson's disease about double every year for psychosis and they stay relatively stable in the healthy control group. So what's happening over the first couple of years of the illness? Well, they're starting their Parkinson's medications, their dopaminergic replacement therapy. Um, and the frequency of new onset psychosis was um, much higher in those people who were starting dopamine replacement therapy compared with a relatively small group that remained untreated over the first couple of years of their diagnosis after their diagnosis. We now know from research that perhaps a minor psychosis is more common in untreated Parkinson's disease patients um, than we thought. This was a study um, that assessed that specifically that was not assessed in the PPMI study. So these illusions or passage or presence phenomena. So really um, demonstrating that psychosis may start early, even in an untreated state in some patients really helps tie Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies closer together again. Um, for those of you familiar with the DLB diagnostic criteria, not only do you have to have dementia, but you have to meet other criteria as well, one of which is having hallucinations. Um, so this, this really kind of ties the two disorders together. So if it's not just dopamine, um, and what else would explain it if it can be partly the illness? Well, this, the strongest association has been with the serotonin system and diffusely throughout the brain. So this is a PET binding study looking at a specific ligand that binds to the serotonin 2A receptor. And on the left is just showing the upregulation in patients with Parkinson's disease with hallucinations compared with those without. And on the right, just showing um, the detailed areas very diffusely where that increased binding is. And of course, we know that, I'll get back to the treatment story shortly, but that atypical antipsychotics are characterized by increased 5H2A to D2 receptor <laughs> binding. Now to focus on treatment. So here I'd say it's promises partially fulfilled and that we have more treatments than when I started two decades ago, but clearly I'd say not enough treatments for the um, frequency and severity of the, the disorders that we're treating. So depression treatment, which is probably the best success story for Parkinson's disease, has really focused on monoamines and um, 
importing disorders from the general population and then applying them to Parkinson's disease testing and applying them. So in the upper left was a study that showed uh, demonstrated efficacy for uh, the noradrenergic system. In this case, it was a tricyclic antidepressant, nortriptyline, that showed a, a statistically significant effect on depression and actually good tolerability in spite of the fact that nortriptyline has significant anticholinergic properties. Mm -hmm. On the upper right was a study taking actually a dopamine agonist, so a treatment for Parkinson's disease motor symptoms, but testing it specifically as an antidepressant in Parkinson's disease and showing a significant effect. And then the bottom um, part of the, the PowerPoint, the slide shows an active comparator um, placebo controlled study um, where testing two, SS, two antidepressants, paroxetine and SSRI and venlafaxine and S SNRI, both showing a significant treatment effect for depression and Parkinson's disease. And the good thing in that study, which I highlight on the right here, is that there's always been concern that antidepressants, because they can induce tremor, as we know, might worsen the tremor of Parkinson's disease. But this UPDRS part three score, which is really an examination of tremor, rigidity, um, gait and balance prom, uh, problems, and um, bradykinesia slowness, really showed very good tolerability for both active treatments compared with placebo. So antidepressants are commonly used in Parkinson's disease and are thought to be safe and well tolerated overall. One issue that comes up, and I held on to this slide for many years now, um, for those of us that treat Parkinson's patients, it's not uncommon to get a flag from the pharmacy, whether it's a call or a fax or an electronic communication saying, oh, this person's on an MAOB inhibitor. The most commonly used MAOB inhibitor is resagiline now, not selegiline, and you wanna start an antidepressant, or this person's on an antidepressant and a neurologist wants to start an MAOB inhibitor. And this raises a red flag for serotonin syndrome right away, which is a concerning um, syndrome. If you read about the details of it, it's a medical emergency really, so you would need prompt um, care. And um, so, but we were, wondering how commonly this actually happens because the neurologist and psychiatrist like me commonly co-prescribe these medications. And I'd never seen a case and I still have never seen a case clinically in 20 years. So it's not that it doesn't happen. I just didn't know how often it happened. So we got some data from a randomized controlled trial of over a thousand Parkinson's disease patients, um, about a hundred of whom happened to be on an, an antidepressant um, at baseline. And then half of whom, because this was a randomized controlled trial, were put on an MAOB inhibitor, resagiline again, and the other half were not. But the bottom line was that there was 100 patients on the combination of an antidepressant and an MAOB inhibitor for six months. And looking at the adverse event reporting data, SAEs for that study, there were no cases of serotonin syndrome um, that were evident. So if this syndrome happens, it seems to happen um, very uncommonly. So the biology, which I've you know, highlighted, has a psychology, of course. Um, anything that's happening in the brain has a good chance of um, manifesting itself um, in a psychological manner, and that's true for Parkinson's disease depression. So there's a colleague um, at Rutgers University by the name of Dr. Roseanne Dopkin, who's a psychologist and has done several wonderful studies looking at CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and Parkinson's disease. At the top was her initial study looking at in-person CBT. On the bottom left was then a telephone-based cognitive behavioral therapy. And on the bottom right was video um, cognitive behavioral therapy, all of which showing significant treatment effects for this population. And again, showing the ability to do it remotely, including by video is really a nice um, treatment advance. And we had done some qualitative interviewing before all these studies were published, asking patients with Parkinson's disease their viewpoints about um, antidepressant treatment. And many of them did have um, concerns. They listed side effects and medication dependency in their words. Um, and many Parkinson's patients attribute their depression to psychosocial factors, not under, uh, understandably, and endorse non-pharmacologic treatment. Um, the problem is just finding therapists, the availability of therapists that are actually skilled in working with Parkinson's disease patients. That's really the bigger challenge. 
So deep brain stimulation is a form of treatment for Parkinson's disease. Approximately 15% of patients will receive over the course of the illness. Usually it's older, more advanced patients. It's people that are quote unquote failing their medication in some way that are typically the ones that are evaluated and offered um, deep brain stimulation. There's two locations that are used. Um, to place the stimulators, the STN or subthalamic nucleus and the GPI, the globus pallidus interna. And there's some question, still unanswered, I'd say, about whether one location, the GPI location, may have a better effect on mood postoperatively compared with the STN. The, one of the complicating factors is that people that get STN DBS are able to decrease their medications more significantly post-surgically compared with people that get GPI DBS. So it's a little bit of comparing apples and oranges in terms of what's happening with the dopaminergic therapy afterwards. There's also been some questions early on after DBS was introduced about suicide. There have been case reports, small case series, saying that somebody had committed suicide after DBS and therefore there seemed to be an increased risk. But again, it seemed that the data was unsatisfying in addressing this in a scientific fashion. So what we did was went back to a VA study called the CSP, that CSP in the VA system stands for Cooperative Studies Program Study in 468, they give a number to every study, it was a comparison of deep brain stimulation, both GPI and STN versus best medical management for six months. So we looked at the data at six months. So if those people that got DBS or were randomized as remain on best medical therapy and did not see an increased risk of suicide ideation or suicide behaviors in the first six months after surgery compared with those patients that didn't have it, not a statistically significant difference. In terms of psychosis treatment strategies, um, I think the primary thing that neurologists and uh, may as well do is to make sure that the person's not experiencing delirium. So psychosis symptoms, it's not considered Parkinson's psychosis, but more of a medically induced or neurologically induced psychosis outside of Parkinson's disease. So attempts are made to do a basic workup often, um, then to look at the non-Parkinson's medications that may contribute to these um, symptoms, such as anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, and opioids. Um, which are not uncommonly used in Parkinson's disease, given the high frequency of anxiety and pain. And then finally, looking at reducing and withdrawing Parkinson's disease medications, typically in a stepwise fashion, with levodopa being reserved for last, so stripping away all of the other non-levodopa Parkinson's medications. There's some very limited evidence, I'd say, for the use of cholinesterase inhibitors in terms of maybe having antipsychotic properties. And since these patients often have cognitive impairment as well, it's not an unreasonable approach. Um, and then finally, adding an off-label antipsychotic or adding pimavanserin. So I highlight those because that's what I'll, I'll spend a little more time on. So why do we even care about antipsychotic use in Parkinson's disease? Well, as a geriatric psychiatrist, we learned long ago that there are risks in what are called dementia-related psychosis. So there's an increased risk of morbidity, which are um, primarily cerebrovascular adverse events, and mortality, which are secondary to cardiovascular events and infections, but not of clear etiology anyway. But this led, um, first these were discovered in the context of randomized controlled trials and then were confirmed in large retrospective cohort studies using much larger sample sizes. And that led the FDA to issue a black box warning for atypical antipsychotics in over 15 years ago now. And then later for typical antipsychotics several years later um, for the use in dementia related psychosis. And the other thing about antipsychotics in Parkinson's, particularly lower potency atypical antipsychotics is that they can have a host of side effects that um, already are problematic for Parkinson's patients. So things such as sedation, dry mouth, orthostatic hypotension, constipation, which are all fairly common already. So we took the opportunity working in the VA where there's a large number of Parkinson's patients, approximately 50,000 receive care in the VA system to look at antipsychotic use in veterans with Parkinson's disease. And we showed something similar to what had been demonstrated in Alzheimer's patients primarily, was that those patients who are prescribed an antipsychotic user, uh, prescribed an antipsychotic have higher mortality rates 
at six months than those people that don't. And this applied to both atypical and typical antipsychotics with the risk highest for typical antipsychotics to things such as haloperidol, for instance. Now that literature is controversial because you can never really fully control for possible confounding variables. So psychosis itself can be associated with um, mortality or the reason somebody ends up on an antipsychotic versus not being treated with an antipsychotic can also be associated with mortality, but we tried to control for those the best we could. And the other thing that we noted in this population was that relatively few of them actually had a diagnosis of dementia. So this seemed to apply to Parkinson's disease as a whole, not just patients with Parkinson's disease dementia. So what's the evidence for antipsychotic use in Parkinson's disease? So this article, review article was written um, five plus years ago. And at that time, the only agents that had really been studied in randomized controlled trials were quetiapine, olanzapine, and clozapine. And only clozapine demonstrated efficacy across several studies. Um, because clozapine is difficult to use with the blood drawing and the work concerns about agranulocytosis and other side effects, quetiapine forever has been the default antipsychotic um, representing about 80% of prescriptions in Parkinson's disease patients, even though there's never been a positive randomized controlled trial. So it's just based on neurologist experience, neurologist comfort with this compound. So six years ago now, this medication was approved in 2016, pimavanserin um, was demonstrated to be efficacious for Parkinson's psychosis and was approved by the FDA. And it's different than that. It's a selective 5H2A inverse agonist and antagonist with really no effects on the dopamine system. And in this pivotal study that led to approval on the left are all the psychosis outcomes on the right are caregiver outcomes and sleep showing really improvement across the board. Um, so this has really been um, a, sh a shift in our ability to treat Parkinson's disease psychosis. Subsequent to that, this is uh, another trial I wanted to highlight. It was just published last year um, in dementia-related psychosis broadly. So the makers of pimavanserin wanted to see not only does it work for Parkinson's psychosis, they had some evidence from a preliminary Alzheimer's study, so they wanted to test it broadly. And they went to the FDA and said, we're going to test this in five populations, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, and vascular dementia. And they did that, and they demonstrated an effect. So this was an interesting design. It's called a, a randomized discontinuation study where everybody receives open label treatment with the compound. And those people that are responders are then randomized to continue on the pimavanserin, in this case, or placebo and you look at the rates of relapse after that randomization. So this was a positive study in favor of uh, pimavanserin. But really what I wanted to highlight was that we had a chance recently to look at and present at a conference um, the Parkinson's disease subgroup. So it was a, not a large population, the, the Alzheimer's population was about two thirds of the sample, but there's, Parkinson's was the second largest subgroup. And here you see very dramatic effects that um, very, almost nobody who was on, remained on pimavanserin in this subgroup had a relapse of psychosis once they had responded in open label treatment, whereas about half of the patients who were randomized to placebo relapsed. So a very um, dramatic, significant effect. ICD, impulse control disorder management options. Here, sometimes you don't do anything because the symptoms aren't so severe and the patients are reluctant to make a change to their Parkinson's medications. You can try to switch um, the Parkinson's pharmacotherapy, which usually means discontinuing, lowering, or switching the dopamine agonist in particular. There is a syndrome now that's well characterized um, that for those of you that are involved in substance abuse treatment would be familiar with called DAWS or Dro dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome. And you get the same physiological and psychological symptoms of withdrawals that you get with many um, other substances um, that people can experience withdrawals from. Sometimes we consider DBS, I'll get back to you, uh, back to that. And then um, psychosocial treatments, there's been a positive CBT study and we use off-label psychopharmacology as well. So these are kind of the general management strategies, just a few more details about them. So years ago now, we looked at a group of about 20 patients with an impulse control disorder and wanted to see what 
happened to them clinically. And what we found was that if you look at the top row, their dopamine agonist total dose, what we call the levodopa equivalent daily dose of the dopamine agonist was decreased over time by the neurologist. They made a concomitant increase in their levodopa dose to offset the loss of the dopamine, dopaminergic therapy. And at the end of the day, their total levodopa equivalent exposure was the same. Most of these patients did have a resolution in their impulse control disorder symptoms. So they basically made a shift in dopamine agonist treatment to more levodopa treatment. There was a question or still is a question about whether long acting dopamine agonists are different. And the reason for that thinking is that short acting dopamine agonists have more of a pulsatile effect. There's long acting dopamine agonists that are given just daily. There's three of them, pramipexol, ropinirole, and the one I'm focusing on here in this slide is retigotine. It's actually a patch. So these are all maintained for 24 hours or most of the day anyway. And in the this is data from over 700 people in Europe primarily showing that this red line, which is about a 2% prevalence rate, um, overall, the rates of ICD seem to be lower in this study with chronic exposure than you would have expected from a short acting dopamine agonist, although it wasn't directly compared. The other thing that the right um, table shows is that it's really higher doses um, which had been somewhat controversial, but that higher doses seem to be most strongly associated with impulse control disorder. So perhaps leaving room for a decrease in dose when people are symptomatic. But the part I really wanted to highlight, which I found most interesting from a clinical standpoint, is that white line, vertical line, was the median time of onset to an impulse control disorder symptom after initiating dopamine agonist therapy. And that's four to five years after treatment. So people sometimes assume that if they start a dopamine agonist and the person doesn't have impulse control disorder symptoms after a month or six months or a year, that you're safe. And it's just not true. So every visit Whenever I see somebody who has is on a dopamine agonist, I ask them about an impulse control disorder symptoms, and you have to really do that forever. DBS is an interesting um, treatment for Parkinson's disease and impulse control disorders. Um, overall, it's been shown that people who undergo DBS and have had an impulse control disorder preoperatively do much better afterwards, although there have been some recent case reports, case series of some incident ICDs, which is interesting. But really what happens in general is that post DBS, depending on the center anyway, you can make a significant decrease in the dopaminergic therapy. And in this case, just discontinuing dopamine agonist therapy and the impulse control disorders largely resolve as do many other um, kind of non-motor fluctuation behaviors. But what happened, and this is very interesting, was that patients became apathetic on the heels of discontinuing their dopamine agonist. And that's because dopamine agonists probably have anti-apathy effects. Um, if they can induce impulse control disorders, they can probably make people less apathetic as well. So in this study, um, right after they found that people became apathetic after stopping their dopamine agonist after um, deep brain stimulation surgery, they then did a randomized controlled trial, very interesting on the back end and put them on this peribidil, which is a dopamine agonist not available in the United States and found that their apathy symptoms improved. So I think this is just a very interesting experiment done to show that DBS can lead to an improvement in impulse control disorders by decreasing dopaminergic load, specifically dopamine agonists. You may induce apathy in that regard, which then can improve with the reinduction, reintroduction of a dopamine agonist. And then finally, we had conducted a um, randomized controlled trial years ago, a relatively small 50 subject, 50 participant, single site study using naltrexone, um, of course, you're familiar that naltrexone is a competitive opioid receptor antagonist, FDA approved for the treatment of alcohol dependence. Um, there have been some preliminary research that naltrexone may help with things such as pathological gambling in the general population. So we embarked on a study um, to take patients with Parkinson's disease impulse control disorders and to randomize them to naltrexone or placebo. Um, on the left, the um, primary um, outcome Actually, this is not one there. The primary outcome was a clinical global improvement, which was not significant. But what I am highlighting on this slide was we had just developed a rating scale for impulse control disorders at this point called the QIP-RS. And actually on that rating scale, which was a secondary outcome in the study, we did so a significant treatment effect of naltrexone for impulse control disorder severity reduction.
So sometimes I will use that clinically, primarily because it's easy to use, safe, well-tolerated overall. All right, so a little bit about uh, cognitive impairment and then integrated care at the end. So is dementia almost inevitable in Parkinson's disease? And unfortunately, um, it is very common, we'll say that, that now there's prospective longitudinal studies, studies that follow people 10, 15 years, and showing the rates of dementia are about 80% in people that live with Parkinson's disease for that long. And there seems to be an inflection point around age 70. So people that have young onset Parkinson's disease, would ha which happens age 40, 45, 50, um, typically do well cognitively um, up until a certain point, maybe it's around age 70 or so. But people that have onset of Parkinson's disease at a later age, 70 or after, um, tend to develop cognitive impairment earlier or soon thereafter, which is not surprising. What we also found from studying our own cohort for what used to be our Udall Center at Penn was that if you look at Parkinson's disease patients who have normal cognition, these are established Parkinson's disease patients, and then develop incident mild cognitive impairment or MCI, their likelihood of then developing dementia in the next five years is very high. So once you develop some cognitive impairment in the course of established Parkinson's disease, it's um, not a good prognostic factor. What, what have we learned about Parkinson's disease that, um, cognition that we didn't know before? Well, it used to be thought that Parkinson's disease was primarily a, a cognitive disorder focusing on working memory, executive abilities, um, complex attention. So things that might be more related to frontal lobe functioning compared with Alzheimer's disease, which is more of a memory and language disorder early on anyway. But more recent research um, in large cohorts has really demonstrated that the cognitive impairments in Parkinson's disease can be quite variable, including memory and even language early on. So I would say it's really um, that 25 to 30% of patients who were not demented have mild cognitive impairment, and there's great inter-individual variability in the, in the presentation. So diffuse Lewy bodies are the strongest correlate. So you're not meant to see the details on this slide. So if you look at somebody's on brain on autopsy who was demented as a patient while they were alive, compared with those who are not demented, these diffuse Lewy bodies, which are misfolded alpha-synuclein, diffusely in the cortex, not just in the brain stem or midbrain, um, is the strongest correlate of dementia while the person was alive. So we've known that for some time. What's emerged more recently is that comorbid Alzheimer's dysology also is key. So about a third or more of patients who have dementia with Parkinson's disease have comorbid Alzheimer's pathology, amyloid, tau, um, on autopsy. So the left is showing pathological findings, the two um, boxes. The middle boxes are showing amyloid as measured by CSF A beta or amyloid PET imaging. And the two boxes on the right are showing um, just structural imaging, looking at an Alzheimer's pattern of hippocampal medial temporal lobe atrophy, also predicting cognitive impairment over time in Parkinson's. DBS um, is relevant um, for cognition or cognition is relevant to DBS because we really try to not do deep brain stimulation on somebody who already has significant cognitive impairment, which is typically why most DBS centers or centers that do DBS will have the person undergo a detailed neuropsychological testing prior to embarking on deep brain stimulation. So this is um, studies and there've been many that have showed impairment in those patients that get DBS versus in this case, best medical therapy over a course of six months. It's the same CSP 468 study I showed you before. But it does seem like it's primarily for patients who are older and more advanced. There've been more DBS studies exploring the possibility of offering DBS as a treatment to patients who are younger or earlier in their disease course. And it seems like those patients are able to tolerate it um, cognitively much better. In terms of treatment for cognitive impairment, this was um, part of an evidence-based medicine review done by the Movement Disorder Society. And you can just see all the, in the box, all the insufficient evidence um, for different cognitive enhancing treatments. There's really only one that we have clear evidence for. Um, rivastigmine, it's a cholinesterase inhibitor. There was FDA approved for the Parkinson's disease cognitive impairment. The study that was done that demonstrated this led to its approval was done 20 years ago. And there's no clear evidence for the other Alzheimer's drug, um, memantine, 
which is an NMDA antagonist in either Parkinson's disease, dementia, or dementia with Lewy bodies. So this is really the huge unmet need, I would say, for most Parkinson's patients. What can we do for them when they develop meaningful cognitive impairment? And it's a very active area of research at this point. Um, mild cognitive impairment has really been the graveyard of treatment studies for both Parkinson's disease and for MCI of Alzheimer's disease. So this was a study where we did um, examine rivastigmine patch in a cohort of a uh, small cohort of patients in, at our center at Penn in a randomized uh, crossover study. And we really could not demonstrate an effect of a cholinesterase inhibitor on cognition in that study. And this was a study um, that a, a pharmaceutical company did of resagiline. Um, they thought that pro-dopaminergic effects of resagiline might have an effect on cognition. And this is MCI again, but was a negative study. There has been more interest in norepinephrine. Um, the brainstem is affected early in Parkinson's disease, including the locus ceruleus, which is thought to contribute to multiple potential symptoms in Parkinson's disease, things such as orthostatic hypotension, mood disturbances, cognitive disturbances as well. Um, we had done a study at, again, as um, the University of Pennsylvania and the VA, looking at atomoxetine, so FDA approved for the treatment of attention deficit disorder and a pure noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor and showing some mood effect on the left and also some effect on global cognition using the mini mental state examination. Since then, there's been a fair number of cognitive neuroscience studies that have looked at amatamoxetine on a range of different cognitive functions in Parkinson's disease and shown some benefit. So sometimes I do use this clinically in patients, particularly with things such as attention deficits. So what else can you do with these patients? Well, I think there are things that can be done. There's some evidence, although I put question marks because it's not compelling enough, but um, these are things that are not harmful either. Um, for cognitive training, there have been multiple studies now in Parkinson's disease looking at its effect on cognition, physical exercise, a, a variety of types of physical exercise. Maybe it's the things we don't do, um, the avoiding anticholinergics, limiting opioid use, um, limiting benzodiazepine use once um, cognitive impairment is present, treating psychiatric disturbances, which are all linked um, with worse um, cognitive performance, treating sleep disturbances, including obstructive sleep apnea, which is not uncommon in Parkinson's disease patients, orthostatic hypotension. There've been studies demonstrating that when people have significant drops in their systolic or diastolic blood pressure, that they do worse cognitively when tested in the moment. And finally, treating comorbid vascular diseases, things such as hypertension, diabetes, um, hypercholesterolemia. So finally, a few slides at the end about um, integrated um, care for Parkinson's disease patients. I don't have so much to say about this, but maybe there's good room for discussion then. Um, I would say that an, an integrated team for Parkinson's disease is highly desired and actually harder than it used to be. I always mentioned this to Joe last night. Um, when I came to the VA 20 years ago, we had a true um, integrated team, um, the movement disorders neurologist and me as a psychiatrist. And then we had other people that were actually on site. And those people should include a psychologist for psychosocial treatment therapy, neuropsychologist for cognitive testing, physical and occupational therapist, speech and swallowing therapist, because dysphagia is so common and problems with um, um, hypophonia, uh, hypophonia and, um, and yes, uh, trouble speaking, communicating are so common in Parkinson's disease. A social worker, as patients become more advanced and there's um, more questions about perhaps placement or in-home support. And then finally, a pharmacist to manage all the complex medication regimens that these patients are on. But that's largely dispersed within the VA system because people get pulled in different directions and for multiple different mm -hmm. reasons. But this is really what should constitute, I think, an integrated team. So I think it's been a wonderful collaboration overall, from my standpoint, working with neurologists, but I would say it's not without challenges as well. As a psychiatrist, I've chosen not to prescribe Parkinson's medications. I could, but I work with what I think are world-class movement disorders neurologists, and they're trained to do this, not me. So I leave that to them. But on the other hand, they do prescribe psychiatric medications, often out of necessity. So when one side doesn't prescribe the other side's medication, but the other one, that's the reverse is not true, it can sometimes lead to some complicated situations. I'd say that psychiatrists in general 
just because of our training, um, tend to rely on informed others more than neurologists who I think rely more on patient reporting and their neurological examination. Um, I try to almost always see people with an informed other, whether you call them a care partner, caregiver, family member, whoever they might be, because I always find it that assessment and management is much more informed if I have somebody else involved and I'm not just relying on the patient reporting. Of course, if a patient requests to be seen alone, I do that, but I almost always see people together. And then finally, the priorities are sometimes different. So using again, the case of impulse control disorders and psychosis, where I may be more interested in recommending a decrease in Parkinson's medications, because I see that as a direct contributing or sole contributing cause to the psychiatric symptoms. But the Parkinson's doctors are often reluctant to do that, and understandably so, because the patients start to complain about worsening Parkinson's symptoms and they feel in a bind and they don't wanna um, disappoint the patient or feel like they're not treating them adequately. So two efforts that I've been involved in in this regard, um, not integrated care as much, but expanded care. So the VA um, has what's called a National Telemental Health Center, and they offer expertise more broadly to the nationwide VA system that, um, that's not readily available. So for me in this case, I'm, I had a small Parkinson's neuropsychiatry um, service over the past couple of years. And what that enables me to do is not only treat people in my local VA, but via video um, nationwide. So people can put in a consult from anywhere in the country and then they get scheduled to see me. It's really focused on an initial consultation because I can't prescribe medication as things stand for somebody in South Dakota, but I can see them, I can see their medical record and I can write a note and um, have ongoing communication with our treatment providers there. So I've seen about 80 patients through the service so far, all with Parkinson's disease, all around neuropsychiatry. So doctors will tend to refer refractory cases or um, differential diagnosis issues. So and I think the referrals overall have been very good. So we're trying to expand that service within the VA system. And video health in the pandemic has really um, accelerated this process, pro process, I'd say. And then finally, um, because one of the issues has to do with how you support people, um, always how you pay salaries and geriatric psychiatry doesn't pay for itself very well. And um, nor does neurology, I'd say um, the Parkinson's doctors. These are very labor intensive um, clinical care services. So what we've tried to do and in the process of doing is um, developing a neurobehavior center at Penn and fundraising for that. So we have donors that are interested, primarily patients with Parkinson's disease that recognize the importance of the non-motor aspects, the psychiatric aspects, and want to find a way to contribute. So we hope to use this funding to build out a center that would support um, additional clinical services, um, allow time for appropriate, adequate evaluations that wouldn't be so rushed, would encourage us to be able to do more routine screening for these symptoms, um, patient and education, caregiver education, training focus, um, and even help develop some additional clinical research. So we're in the process of doing that now. So that's um, the last slide. And I just, these are just acknowledgements, which I don't have to list from different funding support, um, the patients and family members and research staff that have worked together with over the years. So thank you very much. No, but I probably could if somebody told me how to. Sure. I just see, a, I just see, I see Dave Laura on video. Well, I have a question here. Dan, if you think it's Oh, I can see it now. Can you see it? Yes. Should I just read it? I yeah. guess so. I mean, well, I can read it. This is from, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing names correctly, Gopal Vyas, this, okay. Early anecdotal case reports, 80, 1980s and 90s, showed utility for clozapine for Parkinson's non-motor fluctuation on off and dyskinesia. How often is clozapine used for psychosis and PD and have you noticed any improvement in motor function? 
Um, also, can you give, give your opinion on the effectiveness of pimavantern for PD psychosis? Um, I don't, clozapine is just used rarely for psychosis. For these other indications, like on off phenomena dyskinesias, I don't think it's used at all clinically, whether it has an effect or not, I don't know. But for psychosis, it's clearly an efficacious antipsychotic because it's been across multiple studies. But it's when we looked at the VA prescriptions, it was less than 2% of antipsychotic prescriptions in the VA system for Parkinson's disease were clozapine. So I think clinicians and patients um, vote um, with what they think is um, something they want to be on. And they clearly vote that the burden of using clozapine is just too great for it to be more commonly used. I mean, we've known for decades that it's effective, but how you get people to use it more commonly. So I think it's a third or fourth line agent. So really for treatment refractory psychosis. In terms of pimavancer, and I thought the primary study was very compelling that led to its approval. I think the Harmony study, the one for dementia-related psychosis, including the Parkinson's disease subgroup, was very compelling. So I think it's an effective um, antipsychotic overall. And um, yeah. Should we take some from in person? <clears throat> yeah, my name is Robert Schwartz. I'm a basic scientist in Hi. the department. And I really enjoyed your talk for several reasons. I have one question, but then um, I want to explain why. So I used to work with, I'm from Vienna originally, work with Ole Honikiewicz, uh, who discovered too little dopamine in Parkinson's, right, right? right? And the one thing he brought up early on was uh, about male-female differences, which we didn't talk about today. Mm -hmm. And he said, because we know that estrogen and other hormones regulate dopamine, mm -hmm. alone serotonin, we can talk for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your view? Because, in terms of what you talked about, about male-female differences? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't, yeah, you would be able to explain or offer an, a hypothesis better than I could. What I will say is what's confusing to everybody is that Parkinson's disease is a male predominant illness. So if you look at almost any study or even population-based study, it's about 60, 40, if not even higher maybe. Yet, on the other hand, the most common neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's disease, is in the opposite direction. It's about 60-40 for women. So why one neurodegenerative disease that has a lot you know, in common, if you think they're all proteinopathies or both proteinopathies, why one would be tilted towards men and one tilted towards women, I don't know. And I'm not a basic scientist, so I won't even, you know. People have hypothesized all kinds of things, but I don't think anything's been definitively demonstrated to help explain that. Yeah, speak, speaking of which, I did want to just acknowledge that um, I had a slide, but I didn't want to spend time on it. But we lost recently at Penn one of the um, great um, neuroscientists who was the leader of our Parkinson Center, FTD Center, Alzheimer Center, John Trojanowski. He just passed away in the past month. And he and his wife, um, Virginia Lee, are both brilliant neuroscientists and have really done more to advance our understanding of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And I think anybody in the United States from um, discovering really tau as a primary pathology for um, Alzheimer's disease to also discovering um, synuclein um, Lewy bodies and also how um, synuclein can be transmitted um, throughout the brain, really Dr. Virginia Lee's work. So just wanted to acknowledge that since you brought that up. Yes, I see Lisa. Um, Lisa, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, I'll skip the wonderful talk, Dan, although I actually didn't skip it. I said it. Does the timing of starting antipsychotics for psychosis and Parkinson's matter? Is it okay for folks to continue with untreated benign hallucinations for years? Well, I, th I did, I think I had on a slide, and although I didn't mention it, this kind of canary in the coal mine where we know that people that have minor psychosis or psychosis um, have a worse prognosis long term. What we don't know is that if you intervene earlier, whether it makes a difference or not. So I, I think our general sense is that if it's not bothersome to patients or their loved ones, and there's many people that may have minor visual hallucinations that aren't troublesome, we typically don't treat it because we also recognize there's a potential burden from putting somebody on an antipsychotic or altering their dopaminergic therapy. And I'd say the same thing is true for impulse control disorder symptoms. There's some people that have um, are revved up in their behaviors in different ways, but it's not so problematic and they might actually find it enjoyable. And if it's not harmful, that we sometimes just uh, live with it for the moment. I'm Shesho Dori. I'm one of the geriatric psychiatrists, also perform ECT treatments. One of 
thanks for a very comprehensive presentation within short time. One of the things that you men didn't mention is ECT specifically for, uh, in addition to Parkinsonian symptoms and secondary depressions and psychosis, specifically for rigidity and during off phase uh, of the drug response. Um, do you have any comments? Yeah. I didn't mention that, you're right. And ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, has long been known to be um, effective. There was a good review article um, last year um, highlighting the studies that have been done. No randomized controlled trials or clinical experience, but as you noted, it can be quite effective, not only psychiatrically, but it has the added benefit of at least temporarily, maybe over the course of a couple of weeks, of improving the motor symptoms for unknown reasons. That's not a long lived effect, so it doesn't have a permanent effect on the Parkinson's treatment. But I would say ECT for people who are severely depressed and with psychosis, which I think is not so common in Parkinson's, but does occur, can be a, a really effective um, treatment. So thank you for mentioning that. ECT for 35 plus years. In late 80s and early 90s, I used to get a lot of referrals from uh, treat people with Parkinson's disease. Okay. Once they have DBS, those referrals started oh, going down. Very interesting. But interestingly, I have a patient who was treated for both for depression, psychosis, and Parkinsonian symptoms. And we put her on maintenance ECT. She has DBS uh, implanted. Uh, she still comes occasionally for uh, acute risk, rescue ECT. When she comes, she begs me to continue even after the symptoms resolve because her stiffness gets much better with ECT rather than with medications. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, in the chat box, what is the relationship between bipolar disorder and Parkinson's disease? Is there a distinct bipolar disorder phenotype? Do patients with Parkinson's disease who develop bipolar disorder have changes in presentation that are not directly accounted for bipolar disorder occurring with Parkinson's? Um, so I feel a, a, opinionated here and and I'm not saying I'm in the right, but my experience is that bipolar disorder is very rare in Parkinson's disease. And there's been multiple research studies recently that have showing that it may be um, another prodromal feature or a risk factor or reporting relatively high prevalence rates within Parkinson's disease. But yet I always have to put it against my clinical experience, which is just one way to consider an issue, but for me, the most um, obvious, and I, I just al almost never seen, I've had like a small handful out of a thousand plus Parkinson's patients that I've seen that I thought had legitimate bipolar disorder. So typically that would be bipolar disorder um, that would have predated the Parkinson's, right? Because Parkin bipolar disorder is not so common with a late life onset. It's typically in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And it's just been very rare in my experience. Um, sometimes I think people are diagnosed with bipolar just as they are even with Alzheimer's disease and a specific syndrome called dopamine dysregulation syndrome, which is related to impulse control disorders. And these are people that abuse or misuse their levodopa and end up on thousands of milligrams a day of levodopa. And they go into on states and off states every hour or so, and then just keep taking additional levodopa. And in their on state, they can look very manic. They're irritable. They're, um, their motoric activity has increased, they can be grandiose, they can be psychotic, and then they crash an hour or two later and they can become quite dysphoric. So that's like the closest I've really seen to a bipolar type symptoms in Parkinson's disease on a consistent basis. Um, but I don't think there's any other clear association between bipolar disorder and Parkinson's that I'm aware of. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Jane Richardson. I'm in community psychiatry. Uh, I want to start with a comment, which I feel like Dr. Vias would want me to say, which is that I would be curious if it's truly the patients who are saying clozapine is too burdensome, mm -hmm. as opposed to the prescribers feeling like it's too burdensome to mm -hmm. prescribe it. But um, my question was about patients who have longstanding severe mental illness, longstanding psychosis, who go on to develop Parkinson's symptoms. And obviously, you worry about it being a side effect mm -hmm. of the medications and getting people off anything that might be making it worse. But I, I find that it can be difficult still to get people fully evaluated for Parkinson's mm -hmm. because there's just sort of this assumption that it's from the antipsychotic mm -hmm. and then also to balance the treatment going forward. Right. It's a good point you make about the clozapine and I, I can, um, it's very well 
I think it is both the physician and the patients. Although I think the physician burden is not so great um, with the registry, REM's registry. What's that? I think it's fear on the physician's part. I don't, just I don't think so. I, I think patients, I just think patients, I don't think patients like having their blood drawn. That's my experience every week, especially Parkinson's, but it's every week for the first six months. I think these patients already feel so burdened by medical care and prescriptions, this population in particular, that they're kind of hesitant to take on more sometimes. And I don't know. It may also be that there's no studies showing that Pimvancer, I mean, I assume there are no studies looking at clozapine versus Pimvancerin for psychosis and Parkinson's disease, but it may be that if that came out showing clozapine mm -hmm. was better, that then there would be more. So we're embarking, not exactly what you said, but close um, on a study, another CSP study in the VA system that's just getting underway. Um, we haven't even had the investigators meeting yet to compare quetiapin and pimavanserin because those are the two most commonly used. So that'll provide some information about that. And your other one was interesting. If you actually remember to look up, um, there's a colleague at the VA who had a career development award project. His name's um, Jim or James Morley. And he looked exactly at the issue you, you were interest, are interested in because the VA have, has such high antipsychotic use um, in the psychiatric population for a range of disorders. And what he found was that those patients that developed Parkinsonism, he enrolled them in a study and did some DAT scanning on them and also looked at other prodromal features that I had listed. And it turns out that um, those patients, even um, once they were off of the antipsychotic, um, had an, or, or were on it still, had a higher likelihood of having other prodromal features of Parkinson's disease and even showed abnormalities in their dopamine transport or data imaging. So he did think that there's a group that kind of have an unmasking of what may be a future Parkinson's disease by having developed antipsychotic induced Parkinsonism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Steve didn't have a question. Steve just had nice things to say. And Dave, I'm gonna try to skip Dave because he'll probably have a difficult one that I can't answer. Hi, Mark Barta, uh, community psychiatry and a translational researcher. Going back to the depression, um, you mentioned the overlap in anhedonia. Um, right. which at first glance suggests maybe there's a tighter convergence of like a circuitry mechanism with depression than maybe the other symptoms of depression. The question I have is, is there any evidence that antidepressants help with anhedonia in Parkinson's outside of MDD? I don't think uh, I'm aware of research. I mean, there's been relatively few studies, like the ones I showed were the ones that have been done and none so recently. And they typically may ask about depression and an anxiety symptoms. I'm not, not aware of, they, they might have looked at subscale scores for some of these other types of symptoms, but I don't remember seeing literature that specifically looked at their effect on those symptoms. This is sort of a related question, at least in, in my mind. Um, you showed the improvement on uh, depression inventory scores with uh, improvement in motor scores. Oh, treatment on the right, I think it was the dopamine antagonist. Mm -hmm. um, are there any studies looking at the improvement on depression symptoms with improvement in motor scores of people that are not on antidepressants? Um, so, so, so what kind of- They mediated basically through the improvement in symptoms independent of, of the comorbidity with depression. The people on the Parkinson's medications, the dopamine agonist, do they have an improvement in their mood symptoms? Um, I don't, that's a good, good question. And I don't remember research just looking at the impact specifically. Um, in, in the one study I showed you, the Pramapexel study was the positive dopamine agonist study for depression. They obviously were not on other antidepressants. They were just on the dopamine agonist. And what they did was a um, mediation analysis, or I forgot the official name for the statistical, and they controlled for the improvement in motor symptoms because you still saw an improvement in motor symptoms and still showed an independent effect on depression beyond the improvement in motor symptoms. That's not act answering your question, but that's the closest I can come to answering it, addressing it. Oh, Dave Malat. Oh, no, this is Dave McDuff. I'm sorry. Um, I have a 60 year old woman I treated for 20 years for chronic anxiety, depression, insomnia. She developed tardive dyskinesia four years ago after treatment with low dose risperidone. Okay, that's not uncommon. She is currently taking deuteratet 
tetrabenazine for TD and has developed Parkinsonism, mainly bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. She has a strong family history of PD, mom, older brother. Is there a way to distinguish between PD and medication-induced Parkinsonism? Um, gosh, I, I think that's, um, I, I don't think I could answer that question. I think that's definitely a question for a movement disorders neurologist um, to take a look at. Um, and I don't really use the tardive dyskinesia drugs um, personally. So I, because Parkinson's patients don't develop tardive dyskinesia, they develop a different kind of dyskinesia with exposure to levodopa and don't end up on these medications. So I'm sorry to not be able to answer that question. Hi, you. Oh, yeah, so I, I thank you for the presentation, you know, because I, I see Parkinson patients too, I can see, you know, I'm glad to share your experience as well. Uh, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to just narrow down a few. Uh, first, it's like a visual hallucination, for example, you can see in the late stage of a Parkinson, also you can see the early stage of Lewy body. And wonder, you know, if they do have a visual hallucination, it kind of bothersome. And mm -hmm. sometimes I worry about the visual uh, hallucination kind of evolve into a delusion, fixed delusion. And then, so I do want to treat. Uh, is any difference you treat them differently? Like early uh, psychosis in Lewy body and late psychosis in Parkinson's. Yeah, I think they're the similar. It's just there's so much heterogeneity. I don't know how else to describe it. The, the mix within this larger group of Lewy body diseases has just such variable presentation of cognitive changes, whether it's early with DLB or later with PD, psychosis early with DLB and maybe early, but much more later with PD, um, that I just think we don't really understand it. it, it I imagine it has to do with just the how the Lewy body or maybe comorbid Alzheimer's pathology is targeting different regions of the brain at different time points for different patients that would probably explain this. Actually, this morning before I came here, I just saw a Lewy body patient, and actually, I you know she's on both uh, 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 cerebral and uh, pemorrhagic. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I do you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd say neurologists do it. I don't. I don't, don't like to prescribe two antipsychotics, and um, I don't feel comfortable prescribing two antipsychotics. But I again understand why neurologists do it because they're often in a difficult place with these patients. They don't do it to begin with. They end up there because the person's not responding. But to me, the the mechanism of action of both medications, let's say quetiapine and pimavanser, are too similar to think why you would want to prescribe both. They're both five, both have five H two A antagonist properties. So I'm not sure what you're getting with the addition of that medication. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I, I still put her on because her hallucination is not controlled whatsoever, yeah. and then she's a Lewy body, and then. Um, yeah, I just was debating him still continuing right. on the Yeah, it's hard to speak clinically. I will say one other point to remember. I mean, not that you want to practice defensive medicine, any of us, but um, for medical legal reasons, I try to imagine if I was in a court of law and um, I was being sued and I had to justify why I had a Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia patient on two antipsychotics when we know that they have an increased risk of mortality, you'd be probably hard pressed to justify why you were doing that. I was thinking pimovacillin doesn't have antidopamine, right? It's just serotonin 2A. Right. So it's not like a true antipsychotic. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another comment I want to make, clozapine. In this program, movement disorder, you know, we do use clozapine a lot. And actually, Good. happy Dr. Truman is one who's trying uh, pimovacillin a lot on, all of, on lots of her Parkinson patients. They're not very effective. Mm -hmm. But whenever we use a low dose of clozapine, it just works as magic. That's good. It, it, I heard similar, and I'm not saying this is um, your experience or Dr. Schulman's experience. It, when pimavanserin first came out, I would hear from people that it didn't seem to work as well, but there was a kind of a, at least early on, I'm not saying anymore, there was a bias in who was being prescribed pimavanserin because there was typically people that had already failed other antipsychotics. So if they're treatment refractory, of course, they're less likely to respond to anything. But I, I can't say that pimavanserin is less effective than the other antipsychotics. I don't think the data suggests that anyway. One of the patients, so this come up with another question. So this is a Parkinson patient with very early onset of uh, visual hallucinations, mm -hmm. tried pemorrhagic, he failed. 
and we started on colozepine mm -hmm. and it has lots of cognitive impairment. So I just wonder, you know, how much, how early do you offer colozepine for, for patients who have a clear, um, you know, bothersome psychotic symptoms? Yeah, I think it's probably like a third line agent, whether you do pimivantern or quetiapine first or second, and then probably because of the um, difficulty in prescribing it, it's probably after that. So, but that's good that you're using it. So we're past 1.30, oh, and wow. Dan, I don't know if you have extra time. I, I do. So I want to thank everybody, and I think we should do another round of applause. <laughs> And I know anybody that's remote is jealous that we get to clap and they're not. <laughs> so Dan has more time. If people want to stay and ask more questions, you're welcome to. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming in person. I know I um, put out that message and you, and you picked it up. So thank you very much. And thank you, Dan. Thank you. So we can take more questions and people have questions.